makes fun of Detroit emergency manager Kevin Orr, is also getting attention from Orr's former law firm. Here's a look at that website. It shows Kevin Orr as the emperor from Star Wars. But he's not the only target of ridicule. So is Governor Rick Snyder, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan, and billionaire Dan Gilbert. The page also poking fun at Orr's former law firm, Jones Day, and some of the corporations that have supported Orr. Attorneys from Jones Day have sent a letter to the site's creator demanding that they take some of this down. I don't have time for this parody website and goofiness, you know. It's, uh, look, I've been called everything but a child of God since I've been here, okay? <laughs> so, so for someone to put up a parody website, it doesn't impact me. I, this is serious business. Now, that serious business he's referring to, making sure that retirees vote yes on the grand bargain. He admits that benefits are going to be cut either way, but he says a yes vote means that the cuts will be smaller. Plus, why he wants the federal bankruptcy judge to take a bus tour of Detroit. Tonight on Let It Rip, it's now the law. Registered gun owners can keep their names and addresses private. The only people who can legally access that information, the police. How many firearms I may own is nobody's business but my own. But some fear this new law is another example of the government keeping secrets from the public. The last thing we should be doing, especially when we can't get around to fixing the roads, is to put more barriers in front of the public's right to know whether their laws are being properly executed and enforced. We can't eat principles. And uncertainty does not pay the bills. But first, with about two weeks to go before retirees finish voting on the grand bargain, Detroit's emergency manager makes a final push. Hard to imagine, but it's been more than a year since Kevin Orr was appointed emergency manager for the city of Detroit. Since then, the city has filed for bankruptcy. The governor signed a grand bargain. Retirees are voting on the deal right now, and they are rapidly headed for a trial that could decide the future of this great city. Emergency manager Kevin Orr is with us right now. Charlie Langton also in on the question. We thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, for having me. First of all, a status report. Where are we? Can you see the goal line from here? Well, I don't know. Um, we've got two big mileposts we've got to get by. You know, I liken it to a long race, and maybe we can see the fourth turn, but I can't quite see the goal line or the finish line. We've got to get through this voting process and get the votes in. That's that's very important to prove the plan for the people who benefit need to vote yes and get that benefit. And then we've got to get through a confirmation hearing, which is going to be a long period of time. So we've got some significant mileposts that we've got to get by. Any idea of how that building is going so far? Uh, not really that I can speak to. I mean, I, I hope um, that people are hearing and are understanding what's going on um, and that they vote yes because it's much better for them than if they vote no, it just gets worse. Uh, may get worse neither what I propose is plan B in my own plan that we put out. The creditors will attack them. So we're, we're just hoping that, that reason ultimately prevails and although it's hard and difficult, people understand they've, they've got to help themselves in this process. Some retirees feel that they have a gun to their head and uh, the guy is telling them, look, give me some of your money now, but if you don't, I'll take it all late. Well, it's not even taking it. It's it's $820 million that we didn't think of this six months ago. Last year when I was here, I had no idea that we'd have almost a billion dollars in our hands now. The foundations, Ford Foundation, uh, is making one of the largest grants in their history, $125 million. The state settlement, you see what happened in Lansing? I went up there the week before and thought that we were going to get a very close vote, even if a yes vote. And we got overwhelming margins to help the city, $350 million in value, $366 million from the foundations, and $100 million from the DIA patrons and benefit. $820 million we did not have. If you vote no, it's not me taking it from you. You, if you vote no, it's you pushing that money away from you. Meanwhile, here today that uh, federal judge Stephen Rhodes wants to take a bus tour of the city of Detroit. <laughs> well, the, you know, the, there's something in law called demonstrative evidence. That is, you get to actually go see something. And in this case, for the past several months since we filed, coming up almost in a year, we've been talking about abstracts, right? We've been talking about balance sheets and what my proposal for creditors in June last year said and what our plan of adjustment describes. But I think it'd be helpful for everyone, as I've done since being here, to actually go through the city and see 
what it means to the person on the street. It's a different view. I think some of the creditors would prefer that he stay in the courtroom and look at well, photos and videos. There, that, that was briefed in the court. Of course they prefer that because when you're you're on the ground and you actually look at the state, you, you see our school children waiting for a city bus, okay, which is subsidized by the general fund, so those buses run on time. You see piles of garbage around the city that have been there perhaps. There are trees growing up in some. I saw some up on Van Dyke a few years ago. You see the magnitude of blight virtually in every neighborhood, almost, not everyone, but almost every neighborhood, there's some level of blight. In fact, there's a website, uh, goobing.com, that shows blight that can happen as quickly as three to five years. And when you actually see that, it frames what we're talking about when you talk about the need for reinvestment in the city. So you're tugging at the heartstrings of the judge. I'm not trying to tug at heartstrings. I'm trying to give a real view of what we're talking about. And once you do that and people have the opportunity to see, they'll make their own judgment. But I don't want anyone to walk away not thinking that what we're talking about is very real. It really is, and it's very serious, and it's very important to the citizens of the city. You know, some people look at Kevin Lowe and they say that he's a savior. He's doing a very difficult job in, in very tough times. But others look at Kevin Lowe and they see the devil. Right. In fact, there's a website called <laughs> KevinLowe.com. Yeah, I, I, somebody I don't know if you've seen, seen it. it. And, yeah, yeah. and I mean, there's several things on the website. Uh, yeah, one yeah. of them's Coup d'etat brought to you by Kevin Orr, uh, Jones Day, your former right, law right, firm. Right, right. In fact, we're hearing that the law firm, Jones Day, just recently sent the website a, a cease and desist letter. Right. Well, that's, that's typical. Any business, I don't care whether it's a, a corporate business or a law firm, the logo that they have, that's a trademark. And if you don't protect your trademark, you can lose your right to it. So from a legal standpoint, you have to do that. With me, you know, I don't have time for this parody website and goofy you know, it's uh, Look, I've been called everything but a child of God since I've been here, okay? <laughs> So, so for someone to put up a parody website, it doesn't impact me. I, this is serious business. I don't have time for goofiness and playing around. This is serious business for our men, women, and children in this city to give this city a chance to rehabilitate itself and to take this $820 million we didn't have six months ago to pay pensioners. Me, I'm, you know, that's the least of my concern. It, it seems to me that, I, I don't mean it in an offensive way, but are you the best person? to be out in front championing this cause. You've been here a year, right, you've right. seen a little Detroit, but there's a little bit of a distrust by, sure, by, by sure. many people, I think, sure. fair. And outside? Sure. Out no, here no, outside. I, look, I, so why are you championing this cause? Shouldn't maybe some of our local politicians or others maybe do that? Well, I understand certainly that some of our, our local elected officials have been out there, not, not necessarily as actively as I have, because it's my plan. And I have to put my shoulder behind the wheel and push for it. And while I am an outsider, I, I will say this, I'd like to think people understand that since I've gotten here, I've never misrepresented anything. I've never lied to anybody. I've never misrepresented the state of affairs. Nobody's ever taken issue with what we said in June of last year, our June 14th proposal regarding the state of the city, the level of debt, the state of the general fund, and the needs of anything. What I've been hearing from people is we're glad someone's finally speaking to this. Think of this. Albert Cobo left Burroughs Corporation in 1931. Okay, to come to the city of Detroit for what was supposed to be a two-year leave of absence to be the treasurer. He stayed for the next 27 years both as treasurer and as mayor for three terms until 1957. And why did he come to the city of Detroit? To deal with Detroit's financial instability. That was 83 years ago. This is a chance for us to deal with some issues that have been coming this way for decades, once and for all. Is it easier to deal with creditors, the state legislature, or the retirees? You know, it's, it's, it's all uh, 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 come what may. I mean, the creditors obviously are fit to be tied. They're very angry. Um, they are filing, you know, papers for data killing a lot of trees. Uh, the legislature, I had out state legislatures with their finger in my face saying, I won't. Detroit made their bed. Let them lie in it. This is a moral hazard. We shouldn't risk one dime on them. What about my community? We didn't do anything wrong. We didn't elect a corrupt mayor. I mean, the level of anger and vitriol, when that vote came down both on the House and the, and the Senate side, by those wide margins, I was astounded because people really put aside what was vitriol just a, just a week before to do the right thing for the city. And so for the pensioners, I'm saying the same thing. Look at it this way. The elected officials of the state have signed on to help you. 
foundations, Ford Foundation, Kresge, Kellogg, uh, Greater Southeast Michigan, uh, 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 Skillman, all the foundations over 13 that have been Miriam Nolan of Greater Southeast has worked with Gerald Rosen, the chief judge, to come up with $366 million, okay? DIA is $100 million that would otherwise go to try to run. They put together $820 million for you. How can you possibly say no? I don't want it when so many people are trying to help just you. How has this process changed you? I mean, you arrived, what, March 28, 29, 2013? Right, right. Some people will say you're a far different man now than you were then. You know, I, I'd, I'd like to, those people explain it to me because I, I think if, if anything, you know, it's made me more passionate about Detroit. Um, I knew it from a, you know, I'd studied it and studied the history. I knew about Mayor Reading. I knew about Mayor Mariani. You know, I knew about all the history of the city and all that. I'd read uh, uh, books on it, you know, the origins of the urban crisis, race and inequality, and post-war Detroit. So I understood it academically. But to see the people on the street, some of whom will actually come up and say thank you and help me, to see the resilience and greediness of, of the people, to see the kids, you know, they just want to go to school. They want to be safe. To see all that, it, it's made me much more passionate about the city. If I Else. Uh, I mean, also heard you uh, actually put in a bid for a house. I'm, I'm not talking uh, about that are you, are you still actively uh, searching for some property I'm in not, I'm, I'm not saying that the last time I did that, I got out bid. Uh, uh, oh, 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 you're still looking. Uh, uh, Saying, I'm not saying anything more about uh, looking, but but I thought my, my thinking on that was just simply look. You know, I'm asking people to make an investment in themselves in the city, and if I have an opportunity to show that that I'm committed to the city as well, you know, why not do that? Would you stay in Detroit? I don't know if my wife's going to let me stay in Detroit. I mean, she's got to practice in uh, over in DC. But what I certainly like to be supportive of any efforts for Detroit. You bet. Absolutely. A well, part of you is probably going to be a part of Detroit forever. Yeah, certainly Detroit has taken a part of me. You know, I'm sitting on my side. But, um, <laughs> I, believe me, I felt bad. So, uh, Did you like the, you like the job? Are you having fun? I, I don't know if you can call it fun, and I don't know if you like it. Um, you know, I, you know, coming to a city, before I came here, I'd like to think I had pretty much a, a fairly uh, balanced and somewhat good reputation. I've been you know, hit a couple of times in doing this, and people have always questioned my motives, which have always been true. So I don't know if, if it's liking it. I just think it's a job that needed to be done is somewhat of a thankless task, but maybe that's the way it should be. But at some point that stuff. job expires. Uh, yes. The initial term was 18 months, so uh, right. around about the end of September mm -hmm. is when the council can actually vote you out. Yes, the mayor can approve that. Yeah. Do you expect him to do that? And will you be gone then? I don't know. We're, 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 you know, we're going to try to stick to the schedule that the court has outlined. We're going to try to get everything done as quickly as we can. You know, uh, I've been telling people we'll jump off that bridge when we get to it. That'll be another hurdle uh, that we'll work through, but I know that the mayor and council are anxious for me to be gone, uh, to put it nicely. Uh, I understand that sentiment. Um, I'm sensitive to it. There was an election. There are consequences. But let's get through this together, and then we can go back to the regular order. So by the end of September, we may see a new Detroit under control of elected leaders, the mayor and the council, but with some assistance beforehand by Kevin Orr. Well, there's, the, the city's under control of the mayor and council now. I mean, I, I delegated substantial authority. I'm dealing with the balance sheet and the restructuring. And you still have control of police and fire. I still have control of police, so police. not fire, because mm -hmm. um, that's the one to give the chief the authority to restructure the department. and people. Have remember the police department reports to the mayor the chief reports to the mayor and serves at his pleasure but they actually work and report to the commission mm -hmm. so i wanted to give the chief the authority to get through that and he's done a good job all crime is down across the way but people want to feel it they want to feel safer mm -hmm. in the city and certainly that will be restored as well but we made a little bit of progress but we have we have a long way to go and we've got to get this vote in I, we you can't turn away 820 million dollars you can't do it well, we will know certainly by uh, July 11th. Or July, 11th. July 11th. July 11th. Well, the report will actually come out July 21st. Okay. The votes are due by July 11th. Well, Kevin Orr, well, we thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, having me. It's a, a very difficult job that you're doing. Uh, certainly one that uh, inspires and ignites a lot of criticism. It does. Even from reporters like us. It does. It but does. It's, it's part of what you do, and uh, we wish you well, because if you succeed, then the city of Detroit succeeds. That's, it has nothing to do with me. It's about the city. Bottom line, and perhaps history will be much more generous to you than reporters have been. You never know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Right. You never know. Thank, you Thank, you Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much, Joe. Appreciate it.
Tonight there's a new deal in place where Detroit City workers, leaders representing AFSCME and other labor groups signed a five-year contract today. The plan promises to restore wage cuts that hit workers as the city fell into bankruptcy. Under the new deal, workers will see a 5% pay raise starting July 1st, plus a one-time 2.5% bonus next year. We've always been there to uh, try and help the city uh, in moving the city forward. As we has always been a leader, I think, in that in that area, and I think we will continue uh, to be in that way. It's in our best interest to, to work the city, live in the city of Detroit. They want to see the city of Detroit uh, drive. They've always done that, and so they're always going to be prepared to step up to the plate and do what they need to do. We are well aware that city workers have been called upon to make sacrifices over the years, for a number of years, to do that. And if we could, we certainly uh, would have achieved this quicker. The deal also calls for a 2.5% pay raise for three years beginning in July of 2016. Ten people are arrested while trying to stop water shutoffs for Detroiters with unpaid water bills. The protesters sat down to block the East Grand Boulevard entrance to a private company under contract to turn off resident... <laughs> They were eventually released from custody. The protesters argue that water is a human necessity. They say the shutoffs are also harming seniors. To disconnect water from, from people who cannot afford to pay is a violation of human rights. And we wanted to make sure that Hamrick understood that, as well as, of course, of the emergency manager and the governor. A group called the Detroit Water Brigade is working to deliver jugs of water to those in need. More help is available for those who cannot afford to pay their water bills. There is a link. More information on MyFoxDetroit.com. Now Detroit residents making their voices heard, insisting that the city is violating their human rights by shutting off water service to families who haven't paid their bills. They held a protest outside the Detroit Water Board building. At least 50,000 notices have been sent out. And on top of that, the city council hey, has hey. approved an 8.7% rate increase because of all the debt. It was due July 1st. So I get paid either the 25th or 26th of the month. And so I had planned on paying it. And I paid it this morning, but it was too late. We've turned off churches. Uh, we've turned off all accounts that have fallen in that delinquency status where they're 60 days past due and greater than $150. Now the city says this is nothing new. It has always sent shut off notices to delinquent customers. And it is willing at all times to work with customers who come up with a payment plan. Federal bankruptcy judge Stephen Rose is ready to take a bus tour of Detroit. A three-hour tour will take him through some of the worst areas of the city to see the blight and decay, but the judge says it will only happen if the tour is done in secret and in safety. Part of the bankruptcy is that the city has to show that the money that it invests to get out of bankruptcy, and we're talking $1.4 billion, is going to do some good for the city. And what happens, in, in order to show the good of the city, the, the city wants the judge to see the worst parts of Detroit. Now some predators try to persuade the judge to view the city's problems through photos and videos. They believe an up-close look could prompt him to rule in favor of the people and not the big banks and bondholders. The judge says seeing the evidence firsthand is the best way to be fair. I want to know how your tax dollars are being spent. How about some new chairs for members of the Michigan House? The cost, $100,000. And one of the governor's relatives may get the contract. The governor's cousin owns DBI office furniture. He's now one of six bids to supply 110 new chairs. It's getting mixed reaction from both sides right now. Supporters say, what's the big deal? The chairs they have right now are 24 years old. But critics think it's money that could be put to better use, including fixing the roads. Are you happy with your chair? I was happy with my chair. I'd be happy with a folding chair. It doesn't matter what type of chair I want. I want the Republicans to come back to the Capitol and work on this issue. There is no doubt. There is no doubt we are. Because some somebody's going to have to do these types of things, not only the chairs, but the dome painting, all those types of things in the future. And those costs are certainly going to go up. 
Now, some Democrats accuse the governor of favoritism after his cousin landed a previous state contract. It's a charge the governor denies.